Mary, wait. You saw it. I, I saw a paralytic walk past me on his two feet. You asked me before if I knew his name. Now everyone knows his name. And I fear for his safety. I mean no trouble to him. No dishonor. Your friends tried to have him arrested. They're jealous. They're, they're afraid. But I'm not. I promise. Mary, please. I need to talk to him. I follow him, not the other way around. He doesn't tell anyone his plans. Will you ask him for a meeting in secret, under cover of night, at a place of his choosing? I don't care if it's a ravine or a cave or even a tomb. But I just need to speak to him. Please, Mary. Hey, church, that uh, guy in that video is Nicoder- Nicodemus, not Nicodemus, Nicodemus was a, a skin doctor from biblical times. Uh, Nick- Sorry, somebody said that to me last service and now it's in my head, so <laughs> Nicodemus, Nicodemus, and, and, and he is by far my favorite person portrayed in The Chosen. Uh, we've been watching the TV series, The Chosen, as we've been uh, together as a church, as we've been preaching through uh, this sermon series, and, and I just love every time Nicodemus steps onto the screen, I, I get excited. I, I've always loved his, his story in Scripture, and uh, so we're going we're gonna to dive in and learn from him today. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a member of the religious elite He was uh, highly esteemed, uh, an expert in the law of God, uh, wealthy, powerful. Pharisees went so far to be different from from the unbelieving people that oftentimes they became legalistic extremists. They're often viewed negatively because of their their extreme views of the law, which led to a whole bunch of confrontations uh, with the Lord in his day. But Nicodemus was different in several ways. First off, he wasn't just a regular old Pharisee. He was like the top guy. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, which which is like uh, Israel's supreme court. And and Jesus even refers to Nicodemus as Israel's teacher. But something even more so was that Nicodemus, unlike many of the other Pharisees, he knew that Jesus was from God. God. The first time we meet Nicodemus in the Bible is in John chapter 3, and I want us to unpack his story a bit today because within the story of Nicodemus, we find our own story, and by doing so, we'll be able to find some great encouragement. John chapter 3, verse 1, we're going to learn some lessons along the way, and so the first thing we learn is is to pursue Jesus. Nicodemus pursues Jesus. Jesus. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. It's another one of those encounters that's really easy to to watch unfold in your mind's eye, kind of visualizing it. Nicodemus gets his wish to meet with the rabbi, and he comes to Jesus uh, under the cover of darkness. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to why he came at night, Maybe he just wanted to have privacy for this conversation. Maybe he was too busy during the day with his religious duties. Maybe Jesus was too busy during the day. Maybe Nicodemus just wasn't ready for anyone to know about his pursuit of this new rabbi uh, who some were saying could be the Messiah. I don't want you to get too caught up on the why he came at night. Jesus never even mentions it. So uh, what we do know about Nicodemus is that whether he had seen Jesus himself, encountered him himself, or heard from someone else, uh, Jesus de- or Nicodemus decided to pursue Jesus to find out uh, for himself. And so when he sits down, he immediately says, hey, we know you're a teacher from God. Now, this is where I get caught up in this story. We know. Like, we who? <laughs> And it seems that maybe Nicodemus is a representative of some other Pharisees who are secretly pursuing Jesus, and he's the top guy, so he gets elected to, uh, to go scout things out a bit. 
I just want you to tuck that away into your mind. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But Nicodemus is pursuing Jesus. He's got questions, he is curious, and he's got the courage enough to, to come and see for himself. And I want to tell you, if that's where you are in your faith journey, that's a great place to be. Willing to pursue, to come and see for yourself. Don't ever stop pursuing. And when he does, Jesus gets right to the heart of things. He knows Nico's heart. I've, I've, I, sometimes I call him Nico just because it's a shortened version, and I don't want to say Nicodemus again, so... Um, <laughs> But he gets right to the heart of things. Even if, even if we don't know what's on Nicodemus' heart, Jesus does. And here's the second thing we learn is that when you pursue Jesus, Jesus responds. Verse 3, Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. Whoa, wait, what? There's no small talk? Like we're not even going to like pound it or anything? It's just you're right to it. It seems like that's what's been weighing on Nicodemus' heart, things about the kingdom. And, and Jesus says, you got questions about the kingdom, I'm going to tell you, you, you got to be born again. It's a phrase that means two things. You have to be born from above, and you have to be born anew. If anyone wants to be part of the kingdom, God's kingdom, they have to experience this new heavenly spiritual birth. Most Jewish people, and especially the Pharisees, relied heavily on their lineage. They were chosen because they were descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Today we might say things like, well, I grew up going to church, or I'm a good person. I pray every day, or at least I'm not like so-and-so. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, and he says to you and me, no, none of that matters. You must become a new creation. You must be born all over again from above. And Nicodemus is kind of startled by this. And, and, and so he's thinking more naturally than spiritually. And so he asks the logical question of, uh, <laughs> how is that going to work? Something else we learn in Nicodemus' story, when, when Jesus speaks, listen, Listen, ask questions, wrestle with what he's saying. It's okay to wrestle, consider what he's saying, learn from him. Verse 4, Nicodemus says, how can someone be born when they're old? Surely they can't enter the second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh and the spirit gives birth to spirit. And can you just see Nicodemus' confusion? Seriously, Jesus? I'm supposed to, me, mom's belly? Yeah, we're both really against this thing you're talking about. No, 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 no. This is a spiritual birth, man. You must be born of water and spirit. Jesus says you got to be born again, water and spirit, a spiritual rebirth where, where you're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Jesus, I think, is speaking of baptism, the moment you're born again of water and spirit, because this is the same Jesus that later on would say, hey, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. He told his followers uh, right before he left, hey, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The disciples understood that this rebirth happened at baptism, so, so when asked how to make things right before God when we're guilty, Peter says, well, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of all of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, even if you could go back into the womb, that would only still produce flesh, not spirit. And he must have recognized the struggle on the face of Israel's teacher at understanding this. And so he starts to unpack a little bit the nature of the Holy Spirit by using an illustration. And, and that's really the next lesson we learn. See, when you, when you listen and ask questions and wrestle with the things Jesus, is, you hear him saying, he'll help. Jesus helps. He's always ready to, to help, to teach. Verse 7, Jesus says, you shouldn't be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going, and so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Just like the wind, so is the Spirit of God. He, he does what he does. You, you can't see him, but you can sense his presence. You can see his work, people's lives being totally transformed from darkness to light, from empty to full, from afflicted to alive, from sorrow to joy. And at this point in the conversation, Nicodemus is processing all these things, and, and his response is wonderful. It's, 
It's full of wonder and it's full of conviction. He's almost speechless. Another lesson for us is when we pursue Jesus, eventually he confronts. Nicodemus is confronted. That's what the truth does. When, when we're in pursuit of Jesus and we're humble and teachable, Jesus will confront us. It's this beautiful collision of grace and truth. Perception versus what's true and real. My past and what my future could hold. Myself and Jesus. And so in verse 9, Nicodemus simply asks, how can this be? How can, it, how can this be that, that, I, that I've missed it? You just see the gears tearing in this oh-so-learned man. How could I have been so wrong? I've always thought that it's our righteous acts that, that bring us to God and to eternal life, keeping the rules, being good by doing good. And now you're telling me that it's about being born all over again? And it's God's Spirit that's doing this work? Can you just see the flood of emotions going through Nicodemus face to face with God's anointed, just this beautiful collision. A confrontation like Nicodemus has never experienced before. People don't confront the Pharisees. Have you ever had a moment like this? Or several moments like this where you're confronted face to face with Jesus and what he's saying? And Jesus can tell he wants more. Nicodemus is ready for more. His pursuit is only just beginning. His, his eyes and his ears and his heart is, are being opening up to receive what Jesus is dishing out. And so Jesus goes on. He pokes at Nicodemus' pride a little bit in verse 10. You're Israel's teacher, and you don't understand these things. And he says, look, you, you should have some understanding about these things. The law and the prophets speak of the necessity of having a new heart and a new spirit put within us. The, the Old Testament's full of these references. And so Nicodemus should have known some of this and not be so surprised. But Jesus confronts and just kind of leaves it there. And he keeps speaking. Verse 11, John chapter 3, Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people don't accept our testimony. And this is kind of funny. Now Jesus is using we. <laughs> we who? And it could be a reference to him and the Holy Spirit. I think it's more accurately probably referring to him and John the Baptist, who are both proclaiming the things of God that have been revealed to them by God. And not everybody's listening in verse 12, he goes on, I have spoken to you of earthly things and you don't believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one's ever gone into heaven except the one who's come from heaven, the Son of Man. And then he uses this, this reference from the Old Testament. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And Jesus is still confronting. He's confronting the ignorance of Israel's teacher. How, you can't understand earthly things. How are you going to understand heavenly things? Nicodemus, you've pledged your entire life to studying and understanding the prophets, and you don't even understand that when Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, he was foreshadowing what the Messiah must do. Nicodemus would have known immediately the reference he was talking about. It's a really cool thing. All the way back in the Old Testament book of Numbers, God's people were complaining about him and talking out against him. Surprise. And so as a punishment, God sent venomous snakes in among them, and they were biting people, and people were dying. And so, uh, side note, extra credit, bonus, don't complain. That's all I'm saying. Stop complaining. But so Moses is like, man, this is really bad, God, we're sorry. And he repented for God's people, and he asked God to relent, and God said, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to fashion a snake out of bronze, put it on a pole, so that when you lift it up, everybody can see it. And when everybody looks to the snake, they will find healing and be saved. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, hey man, you know that story way back about Moses? That was about me. That's what I have to do. When I'm lifted up on a pole, people are going to look to me. And when they look to me for healing and eternal life, they'll receive it. And I think Jesus is simply pointing out to Nicodemus, this learned teacher, and I think to us, hey, you don't have it all figured out, but you're on the right track coming to see me. 
And these things you don't fully understand about me, that's okay. Just, just trust me. Nicodemus is confronted, but, but here it is, another lesson for us. He keeps pursuing. He was probably offended by some of the things that were being said to him, even about him and how they were being said. And, and instead of just quitting and pushing his chair back and walk stomping off, he, he stayed the course. He kept listening. He keeps pursuing. And so Jesus keeps speaking, and he follows up this next verse. Probably it's called the golden text of the Bible. And it's one that is probably the most famous in the New Testament, if not the whole book. But I want you to understand it's in this context of a nighttime conversation with a Pharisee that Jesus speaks these words. John chapter 3 and verse 16, he says to Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. For, for God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You see, it's the love of God that, that offers grace to us. It's, it's the love of God that compels us. And, and until we experience this, this perfect, unselfish love, we can't really know him the way we should. And this love is offered to everyone, to the whole world, and it's his love that beckons people, that draws people to himself. But then Jesus quickly goes from the depth of God's love to the reality of judgment and the absolute need for a Savior. Because, and here's a last lesson, uh, when we keep pursuing, Jesus provides grace and truth. In verse 18, Jesus says, hey, whoever believes in him and God's Son is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And there's grace and there's freedom for the believer, but the truth is there's doom and there's condemnation for the unbeliever. And those are the only two options. And that verdict, that decision, is a just one. Look at what Jesus, how he finishes. He says to Nicodemus, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds are going to be exposed. Nobody wants everybody to see their stuff. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they've done has been done in the sight of God. Hey, light's coming to the world, Jesus says. That's me. And those who don't believe deliberately choose to stay in darkness. But those who have their darkness lit up by the truth of God's word, who come out and say, look, here I am, that's all of me and all my mess and all my baggage and all my junk, and this is what, it is what you see, right? When we do that, 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 that breeds repentance and sorrow and humility, and we turn back to the Lord and say, look, I under, you see me and you love me anyway. And that's the end of the conversation with Nicodemus. It just, boop, just stops right there. It kind of leaves you wanting more. It's one of these uh, encounters that if there's a movie room in heaven, I'm watching this one. And if you're following along with the Chosen TV series with us, you're going to love this scene. If you've not been, I would encourage you to at least jump on YouTube and like look for Nicodemus and Jesus the Chosen. It's a beautiful, beautiful scene. And I think the reason I've always loved Nicodemus is I just find him so relatable. He shows us the reality of pursuing Jesus. I keep using this word pursuing. So the word pursue means to continually follow or to run after something or someone. Nicodemus was running after Jesus. He pursued him. And you and I were chosen to pursue and when you pursue Jesus today, like back then, Jesus responds. He's alive. He's real. He's active. He, he's, he's listening, and he answers, and he saves, and he teaches. And when he does, you're going to have to wrestle a little bit. From time to time, you're going to have major wrestling matches with the Lord. His kingdom is not of this earth. His purposes are heavenly, and you're not always going to understand. And so, like Nicodemus, humility is a must submission. Lord, you're Lord and I'm not, and whatever you say is, is good and is right is a must. Thinking is a necessity to following Jesus. It's good to ask questions. You'll get frustrated sometimes, and, 
And when you pursue and keep pursuing in spite of the struggle, Jesus is going to keep teaching. And a lot of times, understanding will come. Sometimes it won't. I just want to remind you that the invitation isn't come and understand. It's come, follow me. And that requires faith. And as you pursue, Jesus is going to confront you. (laughs) Brought into the light your shortcomings and your sins and how you've often been and still are often wrong. And I say you, me, us, we, all of us, right? And so this pursuit is going to cost you. It may cost you everything to follow Jesus. But through this confrontation, you're going to be broken. You're going to start asking questions like, well, why would he ever choose me? Why would he invite me to follow, to experience his kingdom? Why would he ever love someone like me? But stay the course. Jesus comes full of grace and truth, and this pursuit will bring you to the one thing, that one big answer of it all, and it is love. God's perfect, unending, totally forgiving love. And this pursuit will bring you face-to-face with the fullness of God's love, the person of Jesus. And in our finite minds, we can't fully understand this. Well, at least I can't. But this pursuit's going to lead you down a path that you've never been before, just like it did for Nicodemus. You see, Nicodemus' pursuit of Jesus didn't end with this conversation under the cover of darkness. We don't see a lot of Nicodemus in Scripture, but what we have tells us that he kept pursuing. This first encounter was in John chapter 3. In John chapter 7, the Pharisees have sent the temple guards to arrest Jesus because he's stirring up the crowds. The crowds are having lively conversations trying to figure out, is he really the Messiah? And when the temple guards return without him in tow, the Pharisees begin asking questions then. Why didn't you bring him back? Why did you come back empty-handed? In John chapter 7 verse 46, they're like, we've never heard anybody talk this way before. And the Pharisees' response, you mean he's deceived you too? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. (laughs) Have any of the Pharisees believed in him? No way. Well, maybe. Look who speaks up in verse 50. Nicodemus has... Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was once one of their, was one of their number, asked, uh, and this is how I, I don't know, this is how I read this, like there's a group of people and he's kind of in the shadows and he kind of says, um, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out uh, what he's been doing? Just kind of slinks back into the crowd. <laughs> Old Nicodemus is still pursuing He's still wondering. He's still asking questions. I I don't, I imagine he's still, he's studying the scriptures more diligently than ever because he's watching Jesus and he's trying to align the things about the Messiah. And is he really the one? It's not public yet. It's not obvious yet, but Nicodemus is actively pursuing. And that pursuit eventually leads Nicodemus to the same place that our pursuit will lead you and me. You see, everything becomes clear at the cross. We fast forward to a day we call Good Friday. Jesus is crucified. He's mocked. He's spit on at 3 o'clock. He breathes his last, and he dies. And John chapter 19 records what happens next. Verse 38 says, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. That's an expensive endeavor. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. We read in Mark chapter 15 that Joseph of Arimathea wasn't just some guy, but a member of the Sanhedrin, a prominent member, a Pharisee, another top dog, just like Nicodemus, and they're both there to receive Jesus' body And together they prepare it and lay it in a tomb. 
You remember when Nicodemus first came to Jesus at night and he said, hey, we know that you're a teacher who's from God. I just wonder if maybe Nicodemus and Joseph were secretly pursuing Jesus together. Maybe it was Joseph who put Nicodemus onto this rabbi. Maybe it was the other way around. Regardless of how, they were together to receive the Lord's body. And when they did, all the meaning of that first conversation comes flooding back. Nicodemus, the son of man, must be lifted up. Hey, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And Nicodemus' pursuit had brought him to the cross where love now had a name, Jesus. And his pursuit, as difficult and frustrating and uncomfortable as it probably was, had brought him to a place of complete fulfillment and peace and purpose, a place of forgiveness and redemption and brand new life. The Pharisee Nicodemus was now a follower of Jesus. I, I can only imagine what all the other Pharisees were saying when they saw this unfold. But it didn't matter, did it? Because he had gone public, he was all in, and I'm just speculating here, but moving forward, I can imagine that his pursuit continued for the sake of all those around him, and all the others that Jesus also came to save. Nicodemus, the Pharisee, is a mirror image of, of each one of us. Somewhere in his story, you'll find your own, wondering, questioning, and kind of just checking things out, maybe even secretly, maybe from the shadows. That's okay. Maybe you've been confronted or you're, you're frustrated with the things you're hearing. They don't align with what you think and your eyes are being open to the truth. Maybe you find yourself ready to be born again and let's talk about that after service. Let's do that today. But listen, wherever you are, keep pursuing Jesus. Keep pursuing don't push away from the, ta the table. Don't go the other way offended. Don't stop. Keep pers this pursuit is going to bring you to a place of love and purpose and peace you've never thought possible. And it's an adventure with a really bumpy road. It'll cost you dearly. That's why we don't do it alone. But keep pursuing Jesus. I think it's what we were chosen for. Would you pray with me? Lord, I'm so thankful for... Nicodemus, for, for, for his story, for his humility, for a man who wrestled with, with all the things he had always thought and then confronted by you and your truth, I'm thankful for his willingness to pursue. And I can only imagine the conversations we might have together in heaven one day. And I pray, God, you would give each one of us the spirit of Nicodemus, to, to keep pursuing. Even if we're still standing in the shadows a bit, that's okay. But to never stop. To move forward, seeking you, listening to you, wrestling with you, stepping into your light that we might see you more clearly and come to know you more fully. Lord, make us a people who always pursue in the name of Jesus, amen.